have a lot to cover. Um, so we'll go ahead and we'll get started. I want to thank everyone for joining us today. My name is Autumn Sullivan. I'm the Marketing Director at Mobilization Funding. With me today is Scott Pieper, the CEO of Mobilization Funding. We are a specialty lender that provides contract-based financing and PO financing for commercial construction subcontractors, uh, manufacturers, and pretty much anyone else that makes their revenue that way. And I also have the pleasure of Ben House, a partner at House, Perone & House, a legal firm in Texas that specializes in construction law, business and commercial contracts and transactions, and business and construction litigation. Did I get all that right, Ben? Yes. <laughs> Thanks so much for joining us. Um, a quick note on housekeeping. If you have a question, please put it in the Q&A. That way I can see it and I can make sure that the guys can answer you. Um, based on the response to this webinar, which was overwhelmingly positive. I know this is a super important topic for our subcontractor audience, so I won't delay you guys any longer. Um, you guys can go ahead and take it away. Thank you very much, Autumn, uh, and welcome everyone. I really appreciate it. Um, just want to give you a, a quick introduction as to why we came up with this topic. When we started mobilization funding and we started finding different commercial subcontractors and working closely with them, we came to realize that there was one big inherent problem that a lot of times contracts were either not signed or they were very rarely negotiated. Most of the terms weren't understood. We started reviewing them for clients on our own and we're not attorneys, but we reviewed them and we would point out certain clauses and, and we'd find out that it was, there was a real lack of awareness with not only the, the terms and the language in it, but just, just in general what they meant. So I thought it would be really powerful and a great tool to offer some basic understanding of these subcontract agreements and just the two, three, four little things that you can do just as a business owner or subcontractor on your own without an attorney to review and read these agreements to make sure they're in line or the way you'd expect. And in having that conversation with a good friend of mine um, who's become a colleague and someone who we use even ourselves here at Mobilization Funding to understand some of these contract agreements, Ben House agreed. And uh, Ben, I really welcome you to the to our, our webinar here. And I really wanted to thank you very much for taking the time and energy to do that and for helping putting these slides together and offering what you're about to offer, which is I know is going to be very valuable to everybody. Welcome. Absolutely. Thank you. So without further ado, let's jump right into it. What I want you guys to get from this um, today is what these subcontract agreements are, what they mean, the specific terms and clauses that are pretty much in every agreement that you're going to want to read yourself and make sure you understand, and then some real tips and tricks and exact things that you can take and change and edit that can keep you safe, uh, make sure you and your general contractor are on the same page, and in the event there is a problem, put you in the best possible position with your customer to, to get a resolution that you both can um, benefit from. So without further ado, Ben, I'm going to let you kind of take it away here, and I'll definitely ask some questions along the way. For all of you that do have questions, please put them in the question section here on the webinar. We'll pull those out and, ask, and get to them right away. We can make this pretty interactive. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Scott. Um, Scott had, a, and mobilization funding had a really, really good idea, uh, frankly, because I have a very similar conversation with many, many uh, new clients when they come to me, because as an attorney, um, unlike, unlike Scott's company, uh, as an attorney, when they come to me, things, things have already gone not well. Um, and I either have good news to tell them or bad news to tell them. And the first thing I do is learn what they already know. I read the subcontract. We're here today mostly to talk about directly about subcontracts. Um, and the, the issue fundamentally, a lot of times when my clients come in, the, the, the my analysis of the contract is the first analysis that's actually been done on a subcontract. Um, and uh, before I get too further, too much further into that, you know, one key takeaway, if, if, you know, this is just too long for you to watch or you don't have the time of the day is uh, you got to sit down and, you know, y'all are constructors. Uh, y'all are not lawyers and that's a good thing. You're out there building stuff. Uh, but the contracts with, with the power of Google, 
uh, with the power of resources like like mobilization funding, like like the folks that are that are partnering with you to help get these projects done, an understanding, a general understanding of the core terms of your contract, even if it's a word document, if it's a one page document where you just you just bullet point. How do I get paid? When do I get paid? Where, what are iffy situations that I need to be worried about? Uh, because as subcontractors, we'll get into this in a, in a little bit more detail. As subcontractors, typically in my experience, you actually can negotiate, but sometimes with really larger builders who do a lot of repeat work, kind of expect subcontractors to fall in line. There's, but I haven't seen that be predominantly the case um, uh, in, in a lot of times, frankly, what it comes down to is the subcontractors in their own heads don't even think negotiation is possible. They get a copy of the contract and they think, this is it. This is it. This is one I, I, I got to sign it. This, I won the job and, and here's the contract I won. That ain't how it works. That ain't how it works. So we can, uh, so my goal here today is to you, for, for contractors listening to this, to walk out of here uh, knowing more about what should concern them in contracts. What terms should I be looking for? What exists? What's out there? That kind of stuff. All right. Um, Autumn, if, if uh, I could get the, uh, I guess, about us page up, if that's possible. Yes, sir. Everybody's reading what I'm reading. Well, while Ben's pulling that together, I want to add a couple things for you guys. Um, having spoke to many general contractors and working with clients as well that do negotiate these, I can, I can assure you that not every little thing in this contract is negotiable from a, to, with your general contractor or your subcontractor if you're a general contractor looking at this. But what I can tell you is that many things are negotiable. And I've actually had many conversations with general contractors that their first, the first thing they tell me is they're shocked at how many people just sign their contract. And so with to Ben's point, really change your, if you can focus on just getting outside your comfort zone for one minute and just think that this is negotiable, there are things you can ask for. Many of these things are simple little things that most general contractors would agree with, and they can make a really big impact on where you can land and stand just in terms of getting your paid, getting you paid faster, um, making sure you're in a better spot, both legally if there's a problem or from a cash flow, your suppliers, et cetera. So I'll let that go on, but just make sure that you're thinking through that and from the standpoint of it can be done, not that it can't. Absolutely. Okay, um, Autumn, is, is, the, uh, is that slide showing for everybody now? It should be, yes. Okay, it's showing for me. Just wanted to make sure that's the case. All right, so uh, very quickly, uh, who I am, House Brown and House, PLLC. We're a Texas law firm. We do construction uh, litigation. We're primarily litigators. We're trial attorneys. Um, I do work on with contracts on the front end. I try to do that. I work predominantly with subcontractors, but frankly, I don't usually see subcontractors, like I said, until something has, has gone wrong or there's a dispute. Um, so it, the firm's been around since 1990. I'm Ben House. Hi there. Uh, uh, Texas Construction Science, College of Architecture, a and uh, And uh, yeah, the, the, the majority of our firm actually, and myself included, actually were constructors in the past and now we're attorneys. So that's, uh, that gives us a little bit of a, a different outlook on things. All right, ready to go, Autumn. So the terms that uh, protect you and your payments, let's go, let's get to it. All right, rights and remedies provisions. So this is, whenever I'm reviewing a contract, <clears throat> this is the very first place I start. Uh, that is because it controls everything. Um, you say you're a builder in Florida. Uh, okay, you, you sign your contract, and if you haven't read it, you may not know that the governing law in that contract is not Florida law. Oftentimes it is, it is law of another state. Oftentimes it is the state that either the general contractor primarily offices from, uh, if they're a nationwide operation. Uh, um, sometimes it is a state specifically chosen because their laws benefit general contractors. So they want their law to apply. 
in what complicates things even more is uh, sometimes the law is allowed to apply in certain states and sometimes it isn't. So sometimes it's a hybrid of different laws. I don't need you to know any of that. What I need you to know is it's good to know what law is uh, governs your contract. If it says Texas law or if it says Florida law in your contract and you're in Florida, okay, you know, you know, the, the core of your knowledge, if you're an experienced contractor, can be relied on more. You know that right off the bat, I get to trust some things I know because it's Florida law or it's Texas law. Next one is absolutely probably the most critical. This one catches folks out every single time. People can't believe it, okay? They don't even think this stuff is constitutional. Bench trial, jury trial, ADR stands for alternative dispute resolution, which means uh, uh, you're, you're gonna uh, go try it in arbitration, which means you have to pay for it usually. So bench trial, okay, what this looks like in a contract is you waive a jury trial. You no longer get a jury of your peers to decide if you breached your contract or if you performed adequately on your job. Uh, you, as a subcontractor, you want a jury every single time. Waiving a jury is a big deal. All right. And a waiver of a jury trial is in almost every, uh, you know, Fortune 500 level, whatever, Fortune 1000 level general contractors contract. They, they've got big, big firms paid a lot of money to write these contracts and, and jury trials are almost always waived. If you can haggle that point, you, you might raise a red flag, but if you can come at them with an approach of, man, I just never waive jury trials just in any, in anybody I work with. I just don't fundamentally believe in it. Guys, shouldn't we just let, shouldn't Americans let a jury of our peers decide, you know, kind of what's going on here. And they might, they might go with that. They might not, but 99.9% .9 of the time, uh, nobody ever tries. Nobody, you just accept it. And that's, and that hurt when I get it, when I get a case with a, a jury trial language, um, or juries removed, you know, I kind of sigh and go, okay, I'm trying this one to a judge. So any of the kind of common sense arguments might get overrun by the pure black letter law and the law can be harsh. Uh, so it, it's nice to have the jury as a little buffer there uh, that your lawyer can talk to and say, look, this is how it was. Uh, venue, this is awesome. So you think I'm a Florida builder. Um, if, 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 we, if I'm gonna take you to court, I'll see you in downtown wherever, Miami. Um, a lot of contracts say the venues in, I don't know, New York, California, uh, Texas, uh, wherever that, that company is. Uh, that sucks, that sucks because you gotta go, you gotta go, I know that's, that's finite legal language I'm using there. You gotta, you gotta go to another state, find a credible lawyer there, find a good law firm there, and, and get somebody to help you out. Um, and you don't know anything about that state. And guess what? You're probably going to end up having to travel to that state quite a bit, at least two or three, maybe even four times during the course of, of a trial, if it goes all the way to trial or litigation. So venue provision and venue is one that governing law there. If they wrote a contract, they're probably not going to budge because the contract was written for that law. Bench trials, they might budge on that venue. Uh, they might budge on that one too, because it just, they, they might work with you on that because at the end of the day, they're not thinking about litigation unless they are. And that's a red flag to you to read your contract and know what you're doing. Um, notice requirements. The other thing that hangs everyone out, uh, there's going to be notice if, if a contract term, so you're reading the contract and that term is breach. And you think in my head that general contractor didn't do that. Or this sub, this this either parallel or or uh, inferior sub to me, they didn't do that. If you didn't give anybody notice of the breach, or if you didn't give the owner notice, or or if you didn't give notice of whatever lien rights you may have, that's the critical one. Uh, it's it's as if it didn't happen in a lot of contracts. It's a hole purposely designed in contracts to fall through, because general contractors and even owners know that they're very typically more sophisticated. They've got offices full of people. They, this, is a, this is always being done the same way over and over again with them. Uh, with subcontractors, they're builders. A lot of subs, that's kind of why I like them. They're my favorite clients because they're builders. They are the folks that put the bolts in the holes and get it done. And they don't have offices just sitting back there trying to read through contracts and figure out notice provisions. Here's the key though, man. 
and women, sorry, they're usually really simple. If you just know the notice rules of a contract, you say, okay, certified mail, got to send it. FedEx, got to send it. Everything that goes to these folks that talk, is talking about something they didn't do or that isn't our fault, goes in this kind of mail. Let's just buy a million certified mail. Uh, uh, buy, go, go to the post office, get a bunch of green cards or go to FedEx, get a bunch of labels and just quit sending emails. You can send an email, that's fine, but start sending letters. Start sending, type, type the email, print it out, send it. I mean, it's not that sophisticated. It doesn't often need to be that sophisticated. And if you, if you send it via certified mail and you get to my office, and I, I'm going to look at you. I'm going to say, you sent all this certified mail. And he said, yes, I did. And I'm going to go, great job. That puts you in such a, such a better place. Hey, ben, um, can I ask you a question for a second? Yeah, absolutely. Saying, like, I'm trying to make some cl- get some clarity just for myself. But I'm wondering if I'm thinking that I don't know if anyone in the audience is either. So are you saying like if, if a notice requirement in there says that any notices need to be received by certified mail, and let's say I'm a subcontractor and it, I haven't been paid yet. I've done two months worth of work and I'm waiting on the pay app and it hasn't come and it hasn't come and I haven't been paid. And I send the letter saying, look, I was supposed to be paid via by 30 days. It's now been 35 or 40 days. And nonetheless, I still am I'm not paid. So I send that email out and I said, I want to know where my payment is. And then let's just say they never pay me for whatever reason that notice on email won't count if in my agreement it says I have to send a notice certified mail. That's very possible. That's, That's very not possible. Important to know. That it's, it's, and oh, that kind of rolls right back into what I said about juries and jury trials. So sometimes lawyers can utilize the law and say, look, I know the contract said this, but the course of dealing, legal, legal parlance there for you, says uh, we were, everybody was working by email. They actually received the notice. Actual receipt should count, right? Jury? Jury says, yeah, man, he got the email, of course. Judge says, no, it says right here in the contract, that doesn't work. See how really, really critical that can be? Not having a, not having a jury to kind of be a buffer there under certain situations because oftentimes judges will hold you the letter of the law. They'll say, especially in conservative jurisdictions like Florida and Texas, they'll say, look, you signed the contract. This is what it says. Short and sweet. So yes. I mean, the answer to your question is yes. It can be that, that, uh, uh, night and day. Okay. Wow. Uh, Attorney's fees provisions. Okay. This can be super critical. Why? It's not about getting the attorney paid. It's about having an actionable claim. Um, I've had instances before where while we had a great claim, it wasn't a big claim. All right. And if it's not a big claim, it's not worth paying a lawyer to go after unless you can uh, justify or you can also recover the attorney's fees. In Texas, that's usually doable. Attorney's fees are usually put in contracts. However, I have absolutely seen uh, several contracts where the general contractor has seen fit to say, no, everybody's going to pay their own way. No attorney's fees are going to be awarded, even if we're in the wrong in this contract. It's entirely legal to do, at least in Texas, probably in Florida. And the result of that is uh, the man with the gold makes the rules. Uh, The company that can afford to have an attorney defend the case and take it all the way and make it not financially feasible for subcontractors trying to get paid, they'll do it. They'll do it. So that's, that's a critical thing. If you can't get, so when you're sitting down reading your contract, if it's got an attorney's fees provision in it, go, yes. If it says, if it's got a damages limitation in it, uh, that's, that's bad. That's no, don't, that's, that's not a good situation because any damages limitation means it's going to be harder to go after whatever money you need. Um, the last thing. Are you, are you talking about damages on the project? Or are you talking about like financial damages, money damages? Uh, financial damages, money damages. Thank you. Thank you for clarifying that. Yeah, no, I'm not talking about, you know, back in the truck into something. We're, we're talking about um, if, if the general contractor has not paid me or has caused delay, which has caused me uh, further damages or further, frankly, mobilization costs or more overhead, how are my damages limited by that, by that contract? And they very often are. And understanding that is critical because it goes into your decision-making process. You know, you say, well, 
look, GC, I know, you know, there's, there's, there's a, uh, I know you've had a delay. I know it's not your fault, but look, I, I, the contract says um, either I get a payment of overhead or if the contract says you don't get any damages for delay, you got to take that into account in your business practice and think, okay, I, I might have to demobilize. It might actually be cheaper to demobilize than to keep my men on the job uh, for as long as they need to be, my personnel. So, all right, moving right along. All right, this one's wordy. Uh, I think I can help a little bit here. Facts constituting default. Understand what effect another contractor's default has on you. So the purpose of this slide is to, when another contractor screws up or delay, cause a delay, you know in your head, okay, inequity, in, in fairness, uh, this isn't my fault. But uh, we all know how, um, we all know how construction scheduling works. There are milestones you have to meet. There's a critical path. All right, if the guy in front of you hadn't finished paying the foundation, pouring the foundation yet, you can't do the flooring. You can't do much of anything, really. Uh, if they haven't finished foundation, that's on the critical path. You, you as the next subcontractor in line uh, are in trouble. So what happens when somebody else makes a mistake? Okay, depending on the contract language, the following uh, may or may not place a contractor in default. Um, so this this goes around to the, so this is the general contractor. So you're, you're the sub. You think uh, there's a general contractor above you. All right. Delay in payment. Is there a delay in payment to you an actual breach of their contract? And by breach, I mean, have they busted the contract so bad that you are actually entitled to something, that you're entitled to damages. Maybe that you don't have to do your work and you get paid for the entirety of the project. That is called a material breach. Material breach. If a party materially breaches a contract, the other guy who didn't breach, that party is forgiven. They do not have to perform the contract and they get paid as if they did perform the contract. That is the fundamental cornerstone of most contract litigation is the question of whether the mistake was a fundamental breach. So the question with these bullet points here, delay in payment, how much of a delay is a fundamental material breach? Withholding of payment, how long can they withhold my payment that they have in their possession that they got from the owner, they being the general contractor, before I as a subcontractor uh, before they've materially breached our contract. Failure to perform, this is kind of what we talked about earlier. They're, the general contractor or some other sub is supposed to self-perform, they didn't. Uh, has any party materially breached such that my performance is forgiven? Uh, improper performance, somebody made a mistake, right? Liens filed on the property. A lot of language in these contracts says that you subcontractor cannot allow liens to be filed on the property. That is a breach of your contract to the general contractor. Okay, so if, if a subcontractor files a lien, you got to go back to your own, con you know, regardless of worrying about that, that lien and that sub wanting money from you, you got to worry about, it's a two front battle. Okay, it's like the Germans in World War II. They're fighting the Europeans on one side and the Russians on the other. All right, you got to figure out, uh, my subcontractor side is, am I in breach to my general contractor? And if I am, because this lien happened, how bad is this going to be? How long do I have to fix it? Who do I have to provide notice to? Who do I have to pay? I probably have to uh, cover the costs of the general contractor in getting this lien knocked off. I might even have to take these folks to court immediately. Uh, so that's critical, critical language to know there. And, you know, Having legitimate fights with sub subcontractors, man, that happens all the time. Hey, they think they performed, you think they didn't, that you quality of work issues happens all the time. So this is stuff that comes up. It really does. Force majeure, man, uh, a lot of us might have dealt, a lot of subcontractors might have dealt with this one recently. A coronavirus my project was shut down or I couldn't get enough workers or we're in, we're in a field or in a location where everything else is shut down. Uh, I don't have the PPE in time. 
what does my contract say uh, about what I can do there? And that's been the subject of another webinar. So I'm not going to go into it here, but uh, these are all contract deadlines, of course, differing site conditions. The plans were different. Long story short, you got to, with every contract in every construction project I've ever seen has been breached to some degree. What matters is, is it a material breach? Have you material breached? Has the general contractor material breach? Because if it hits that point and somebody gets fired off the job or decides to leave the job, you have to be very confident in, uh, in how bad the, uh, the situation was. So that's, that's something to absolutely 100% be aware of. Oh man, okay. I really did fill this one with important stuff. <laughs> okay, the express negligence rule. Uh, I'm not sure if it's called the express negligence rule. I'm a Texas attorney. I'm only licensed in Texas. Uh, I, my understanding is Florida law is actually very similar to Texas law. And that has been, that has been my experience as well in, in the limited Florida uh, work I've done. Um, the express negligence rule says that, at least in Texas, <laughs> this is, and this, subcontractors find this unbelievable when they hear about it. If a general contractor messes up it, and maybe it's half their fault, maybe it's 75% their fault, maybe it's 100% their fault. And the, the contract can say, in many states, can say, uh, well, even if we mess up, subcontractor, it's in our contract that you indemnify us for our mess up. That means it's not my fault anymore. It's your fault. And you got to figure it out. Up until about a decade ago, this was legal in Texas. Um, I don't know. I don't have a survey for you of states that this is still legal in to do, but I am, I am aware that there are some. Uh, and, and it's varying degrees too. Some states say, hey, if it's, if it's a mix of fault, then it, they can downshift the, the, the mix to uh, the subcontractor. And by downshift, I mean poke the subcontractor in the chest with a contract and say, this is your fault. This is your job to fix now, even though it was half our fault. It's 100% on you to resolve the situation. So Texas made this kind of, they limited this uh, 10 years ago. Um, but here's the catch. The language is still in a bunch of boilerplates. I have contracts come across my desk all the time in litigation, and I see that illegal language is in the contract. Okay, now as subcontractors, without having an attorney review a contract, you're just not going to know this. You're just not going to know this. But what I want everyone to have in their head is when a general contractor say something goes wrong on the project, I don't know, property damage, uh, maybe, maybe guy was hurt, whatever. And uh, the general contractor comes to you and says, hey, I know this was, you know, I know what happened here, but, uh, you know, contractually speaking, this is on you. Uh, you don't say anything uh, and you go have a lawyer read the contract. That's, that, is, that is the key advice here. Don't take a position. Don't argue terms of the contract. Don't try to Google it. Those types of situations unlike, you know, timing situations or notice provisions where you can just read it and it is what it is. This is the time when you need to be very, very careful, very, very careful. Um, because a lot of the times you can't trust <laughs> the language that's right in front of you that you can read because it might not be legal. It might not comport to the law of the state you're in. And then you got to figure out, Hey, what law, what, what state's law controls, right? Because it's not, it's not where it's not necessarily, where you're located. So uh, last, last bullet point is the key. If a superior contractor claims you're responsible for their negligence, don't say a word and immediately get somebody's opinion. So that's, 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 this is, this is the most common thing. This is the most common language when I'm asked to adjust or to review a contract I change. Most absolutely hands down most common language. I redline this because when you get a lawyer involved, uh, or, or uh, and they can, I can take this contract back and I have a legal argument. I can say, look guys, we're signing something that shouldn't be signed by either party. And, uh, and they very often, uh, in fact, I, I don't think I've ever had it come back where, where they have said, no, we're going to keep it the way it is. We, we like it. No, they like to, 
they like they'll at least meet you halfway or or I'll let you let you augment that language so that the fault lies more fairly on who the fault should lie with which you would hope is how contracts are written but very often it's not very often hey hey ben one quick question while i'm thinking of this is you know i get a new common contractor i get a new contract i'm thinking to myself like this is great information it's a lot we're going to share the slides so everyone will have this info but at the end of the day, even if I read things like, you know, my, I'm talking for myself now, I can read legal contracts and oftentimes I get the general gist, but I'm, I, I can be wrong that my, my understanding of it is inaccurate compared sure. to the law. Um, other times I read it and read it and read it and I still don't know what it means. Yeah. So I always, I've always just led to say, you know what, I'm just going to have an attorney review this. So my question anyway to you is, if I'm a contractor, I need to get this signed. If I were to send something, what are the expectations for the amount of time it would take to read a contract up front before it's signed, get a little quick analysis of it? You know, what is the cost that cost or, or hours they should, in, they, th they should think to invest for an attorney to review something like this? Okay, well, I got to give you the standard attorney answer because it's actually right, but I have read contract. I'm not going to list the names, but I have read contracts from probably two dozen of the of the country's largest general contractors for the express purpose of telling subcontractors uh, what the contracts say. Those contracts are written by teams of attorneys, sometimes a couple different law firms. Uh, they spend a fortune writing those contracts, and they can be huge. They can be huge. Alternatively, some t many, many general contractors use AIA or consensus docs uh, contracts. Um, there's, there's a couple others uh, in residential contracting. There's several and usually they're state specific. Those are much shorter. Those are much shorter. And in even what's even better about those kind of form contracts is they have what's called a general conditions. And this is the thing that people hate uh, me when I tell them about because they come in to my office with an AIA contract. AIA contracts about eight pages, uh, the, the general subcontractor version of it, uh, depending on, you know, what you add. And then you exhibits, this is, doesn't include exhibits on the back end. All right. I then have to explain to everyone that, well, you see where they refer to general conditions in the AIA contract and they go, yeah, I see that. What is that? What's a general, like you're talking about general site conditions, right? I know what general conditions are. No, no. General conditions in contracting is a, in specifically with the AIA is about a 200 page uh, separate document that is like a Bible of rules. Uh, I am familiar with them to the extent that I, when I see an AAA contract and it's got general conditions attached, I, I generally know what I'm to expect. Um, but with either the AAA boilerplate co contracts or the, uh, these, these larger scale contracts, and this is why folks a lot of subcontractors don't get an attorney involved until it's a little late in the day. It can, it takes me and my own law brain sitting here. It takes me hours to get through uh, even contracts that I'm familiar with. And, and here's the deal. When you get a lawyer involved, we have to make sure even if it's a form, even if it's the, if it's the general, general conditions uh, stuff, uh, we have to make sure that they actually are the same general conditions because there are edited general conditions all the time. I've done it myself. Uh, and you, you, I, luckily I use software to do a lot of that, but to answer your question. So I wanted everybody to know the behind the curtain of how it works. Um, and to answer your question, um, it's the, the shortest time I think in my career I've ever told someone I could read a very simple contract. Uh, was um, a couple hours and that was because I think the contract was a single page. I think it might have been a purchase order and it was a couple hours because because the contract was so small, it didn't say anything. So then to understand their situation, I had to look at the email and the correspondence and figure out the course of dealing. And then I knew, okay, where you're at. Um, so it's even with simple contracts, you would think that simplifies things. Sometimes the longer contracts actually simplify things. Uh, to give you, if, if a lawyer says, hey, it's gonna take me 10 hours to get through this and give you an opinion, that's not unreasonable. That's not unreasonable, not at all. Um, 
as far as expense, it's, 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 you know, it's whatever the rates are. It depends in New York. I hear lawyers getting $600 an hour, Texas, largely we don't do that. Some, some of the massive firms do. I don't want to bend anybody's ear, but um, now the last, my parting glance of this is if you can negotiate with a lawyer on the front end, when the lawyer knows there's no litigation pending, he's just looking for hot spots to point out to you that are important. That is an entirely, it's a different analysis. It's different homework. A lot of times that can be done. That analysis, just to give you a heads up, to give you a bullet point of what's going on, can be done much cheaper, much cheaper. And, you'll, and it'll give you, it won't give you a perfect view, a perfect analysis, but it will for maybe a couple grand on, say, a, a $100,000 contract, you will know what's going to hurt you and you will know what's going to help you. And it's, if you, it's going to make much more than a couple thousand dollars a difference almost every single time. If, if you get that done, I can't recommend it highly enough. And, you know, I hate to say this, but shop attorneys, if, if you're looking for quality, you're looking for quality, but uh, find a price that's reasonable, spend a little time looking around uh, and get your contract looked at. Just do it every time. Guys, what I'm hearing Ben say, and um, what I do in my own practice here, is we send stuff out to attorneys, legal documents that we have to read. Obviously we're not doing construction, but we're very familiar with them. And at times we have complicated deals that we're putting financing structures together for that we want to understand that contract our client has and we, we send it out and get information. But here's what we do. And I would recommend at a minimum, you take what Ben's advice is, and this is a way to make it a little more efficient for the attorney. I list out for the attorney, the bullet points. I say, look, in layman's terms, this is what we negotiated. I'm going to do this work. I'm expected to be paid in this matter of time. They're telling me I need to do this, 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 and this. I want to make sure that this, this contract is correlated to my layman's terms version of what I understood as I expressly talked to the project manager. And oftentimes what you'll find is the, it's not that the project manager or whoever it is that you're dealing with one-on-one -on -one is actually lying to you. But what you'll find is they're working off of a template set of contracts that they very well intend it to be exactly what they said, but it just doesn't for whatever reason. And so if you at least tell the attorney what you're expecting, what you're expected to do work-wise, what your intentions are, how you're supposed to be paid, what the pitfalls are that you want to make sure you're covered for that you probably may have negotiated just verbally to someone, and give it to them just in a bullet point list when you send it in, they can give you a pretty quick analysis back. That's definitely cost effective in my, in my opinion. And oh, the, absolutely phenomenal point. Yeah. If you put me, I call it, I call it putting me in a box. If you put me, if you target me, if you use me like a rifle and say, Hey, look, I know this general contractors might have a history of doing X, Y, and Z. Tell me how that plays out here. Or, I think this project uh, is a little dangerous, or I think this, that, or the other. Give me sectors of danger or of worry um, and come educated on the contract. I get, if you, if, I, know, I get this all the time. If you get the subcontractor who comes in your door and says, hey, would you sign this? I, I, I kind of I kind of glaze and I go, man, I'm not a I'm a lawyer and I'm a construction lawyer, but I'm not I'm not you, man. I, I don't run your business. I don't know what level of risk you're willing to take. And for me to give you a full blown analysis of this contract, the analysis is going to be multiple times longer than the contract itself because I got to kind of teach you. So Scott's approach when working with attorneys generally is fantastic. The best I I gauge most of the time the success of my litigation based on my clients, my clients understanding uh, the, the level of sophistication, the, the, uh, the ability for, for me to trust what my client has said and, and believe that uh, his understanding is, is accurate and that what happened on the, the project was accurate. If I've got that in my pocket, if I've got a you know, AAA uh, type of caliber of person or organization in my pocket, I'm going to do very well, uh, I think, in the litigation. That's just, that's just that. The other thing I want to add to that is when you're working with your attorney and you're giving them the information that you understand and how you're doing it, you got to understand, in my personal opinion, attorneys are going to tell you where all the risks are. They're typically going to come at it from the worst case scenario. 
and you're not going to be able to negotiate every single thing out of an agreement that you want. You're probably going to go into every agreement with a little uncomfortable in certain spots, but you want to manage those risks. And they're going to, a good attorney is going to help you boil down what I call business decisions. You want to take legal descriptions of what's happening in this agreement and boil them down into business decisions so that you can say to yourself, all right, I understand all the legal risks, but from a business perspective, good business decision, this is a customer I can trust. You at least know what your, your risks are by making the business decision to move forward and not negotiate a point or negotiate it to a certain point. The other, that's the first thing. The second thing is when your attorney, when you go through this process with your attorney and do red lines back and forth with the general contractor and the sub, you'll be really, really surprised at how much you learn and how fast you learn it with just one, one time through. So where you may invest three, $4,000 or 2000, whatever the number is to go through a pretty uh, detailed uh, general subcontract agreement, you'll come out of that agreement with a lot of knowledge. It's not, it's not a four or $5,000 endeavor. Every time you sign a contract, you'll be able to read through some of these provisions, just how quickly you get educated on that red through that red line process to know where some of these pitfalls are, and then you can target your, your um, attorney. So think of it like an initial investment up first, up front, and then you'll have it, then you can create that box that Ben appropriately taught, called it. He's targeted, knows where to go. You have a good general understanding. It gets boiled down into business decisions, and then you can make them and execute. That's, that's the key. That is an ultimately perfect place to be, in my opinion, entering into a project with a subcontract agreement. The, the tail end of that is if, you, if you're going in there reading it on your own and you still have questions, the general contractor doesn't. You're up against the general contractor, you're typically sophisticated, and you're up against their lawyer or their team of lawyers as well. Uh, you know, in, in contracting, the contract, everybody's going to do the work, and, and I bet everybody watching this knows is extremely confident in their ability to do the work. But that really doesn't have anything to do with getting paid. A lot of the times it comes down to the contract. Um, that's why I, th that's this next slide kind of shifting gears. Um, no, um, Autumn, can we go back one? Yes. Critical analysis. Okay. Know which contracts apply to you and read them. All right. So we've been talking, uh, I've been probably errantly talking about and probably overemphasizing the importance of your contract with the general contractor. Kind of bad news. It is totally legal for a general contractor to require you not only to meet the terms of your contract with the general, but the general's contract to the owner. Okay. And sometimes that general contract, that general owner contract uh, is a lot longer, a lot more sophisticated, a lot more painful to read than a subcontract. So, and again, if you, if that language is there, well, your attorney's going to say, well, guess what? You also have to, you know, meet the requirements of this other general contract. And usually the saving grace here is that with longer, more sophisticated contracts, usually all of the requirements of the general contractor are already set forth in your subcontract with them, but sometimes they're not. So if you have, so here's what to think as a subcontractor, if you see that language in there and it says you are also uh, held to the responsibilities, terms, conditions, blah, 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 of, uh, of our contract with the owner, first of all, first thing you do, get a copy of it, get a copy of it, just have one for reference, read the, your requirements. And if there's any, just like what, what Scott and I were just talking about, if there's hot button topics in the contract, if there's stuff you're scared about, you're worried about, or you think is, is not right, definitely read the counterpart of that language in the general contractor's uh, uh, contract with the owner. Um, that'll, it might be the same. It might be different. Uh, it might be more, it might have more requirements. Um, this is, this is so, and I have seen it be the case where there's an extremely brief subcontract. I mean, one page, but the subcontract has this language in there. It says, yeah, you're held to all the, the duties of our general contract with the owner. Okay. That means, and how this, this actually comes out is the general contractor usually has a very sophisticated requirements uh, to get paid by the owner. All right. So you, your submissions, your payment submissions 
uh, have to be uh, all I's dotted, all T's crossed in a specific form with specific numbers. Uh, and your subcontract doesn't say a thing about that. And you're just sending in pay submissions and then they're paying them, they're paying them, they're paying them. And then the project gets a little tight on the general contractor, general contractor gets in trouble. What do they do? They pull out that contract and say, you know, you've been doing this wrong and uh, we're done with it. So you got to learn all these new rules and you haven't met any of these requirements. I have seen this happen time and again. So if you think your contract's one page real simple, just think to yourself, okay, simple contract, does it have the language in there binding me, binding me as the sub to the general contractor's agreement? If it does, uh, that opens up another box of worms that you then need to think about. If it doesn't, okay, feel more comfortable about the fact that the, what's in front of me is my contract. Huge world of difference between those two situations. And it's not something folks usually expect. So that's how it earned its way into this presentation. That's a good point. Ben, I'm looking at um, just conscious of time. We have probably about 12, 15 minutes left. And I know there's a key things like paid when paid and some other yep. key clauses. And we can always um, put some of these things in a summary too, but I, I definitely want to get through some of these bigger ones that you've put out here in, in this agreement while we still have everybody. Will do, will do. Well, um, uh, paid to paid versus paid when paid is the next one. And then the uh, uh, effects of project delays, I'm not going to belabor that. Um, conditions uh, proceeding to payment. That's, that's also a pretty, pretty quick one because we've kind of already covered it and uh, negotiating subcontractor agreements. That's the key one. Um, I actually want to get to there at the end. So I'm not going to give these equal weight um, paid if paid versus paid when paid clauses. These are also called contingent payment clauses. I would love to tell uh the audience exactly what the language of these con of, of this uh, type of clause looks like, but it's, it's, there's a million different types of it. What this does and why it's important. Paid if paid clause. Paid if paid is the not fun one. I mean, it's, it's the one that can get very ugly. So a general contractor uh, or some, someone in the chain of contract uh, makes a mistake or gets in a dispute with somebody, they don't get paid by the person superior in chain of contract. All right. This language is legal in uh, all, but I think 10 or 12 States uh, it's legal in Texas and it's legal in Florida. Paid if paid means if I don't get paid by the owner or if I don't get paid by the subcon the contractor above me, I don't have to pay you. It is purely contingent. If I don't get paid by them ever, I don't have to pay you ever. Okay. That means that puts responsibility, that puts you in the shoes of somebody who you are not at all con in control of operationally above you. All right. How is that different from paid when paid? Paid when paid has a reasonableness attachment onto it in a lot of states. All right. What does that mean? Paid when paid is if I don't get paid, I cannot pay you for a reasonable period of time. After that reasonable period of time goes, or after it's been just a ridiculous period of time, I may, I as the general contractor, as the, the payor, may fall into breach, which we talked about earlier, in which case uh, I haven't paid you. Your, your duty to complete the project is forgiven. Demobilize, file your liens, hire a lawyer, uh, and uh, go get your money back. Um, so the difference in these is astounding. Paid if paid, if they're not paid, they don't pay you at all. And it's legal. Uh, paid when paid, if they don't pay, if they're not paid, you get, you have to sit on your hands for a while and it's totally legal for them to delay the payment. Um, some states like Texas actually have a prompt payment statute that applies to certain, certain states. So sometimes a law can come in and save you. Uh, but uh, that is the fundamental difference between these. Keynote, paid if paid, the, the evil, the bad one, the PIP clause, um, that one is not legal, like I said, in every state. So what you might want to look into, if you're going to put your attorney in a box, if you're going to go to your attorney's office and you got a paid if paid language, point it out to him and man say, hey man, I'm sophisticated enough to know this might not be legal here. Is this legal here? Or to what extent is it legal? And if it's not legal, do we just strike that line or does it turn into something else that is legal? Okay, that's where your lawyer can give you those answers a lot of the time. 
this is absolutely critical. Um, folks caught out on paid if paid deals uh, on multi-million dollar projects. It's um, it is a not good situation. Okay, uh, very quickly, <clears throat> effects of project delays. Uh, is the delay your fault? Is the delay not your fault? You can read. I'll allow the audience to kind of read these at their leisure. I don't. I don't want to to read them off, but the AIA and consensus docs contracts have terms that try to be fairly equitable such that if a delay is not your fault, oftentimes it puts, it requires the owner to then step in and pay you a little bit more money for your overhead on the project. If the delay is your fault, okay, do you get more time or are you in fundamental breach? I'll tell you that if you're under an AIA or consensus doc contract, you usually are entitled to a little bit more time. Um, it might come out of your pocket, but at least you get the time, which means I'm not cooked. I'm not in breach. They can't just fire me. Uh, I get a little bit more time to fix it. So delays play out um, differently under every single contract. If you're, if you're in a weather area, if you're in uh, if, uh, with COVID going on right now, just just count on material delays, just count on shipment delays, seeing those all over the place. Um, just know what you know, how evil, how draconian your contract is about delays and know how draconian it is about the delays of others. Okay. If the, if a sub in front of you, uh, if they, uh, if there's a delay there, do you get to, do you get more money? Do you get actually reimbursed by the owner from them? Um, should that sub have to have to help you out a little bit or take on some of your cost burden? The only way to know any of this uh, is, is to read the contract and it's critical. To, and that, this kind of stuff is like, you can read it and understand it. it. It'll be night and day. You don't need a lawyer for this. You just need to know, you just need to have read it and understand how it works. All right. Um, conditions precedent to payment. We talked about this a little earlier, so I don't have to, uh, but this, when projects get tight, when something goes iffy, all right, then this is when general con the actual terms of the contracts are often used to the detriment of subcontractors. They say, okay, we know you've been making pay applications via email. You just give us the number that's supposed to be paid and we're paying attention to the project. So we know about where you are. So we know we the green light that number or not. Okay. That all goes out. The, if the general contractor, uh, I had a case where uh, uh, that's closed now where a subcontractor made a huge mistake and the other subs weren't getting paid because the general contractor wasn't getting paid by the owner. Okay. Well, what did the owner, now the general couldn't justify that to the other subs because it wasn't the other subs fault. They had done the work. But what the general started doing was saying, yeah, well, none of your pay applications have met the rules and therefore we're withholding. Now, will that work in court? Maybe, depends. Depends on whether you have a jury, depends on what state you're in, uh, depends on the law. But the long and short of it is the companies who were on top of the rules of the actual contract about sending in their pay, their uh, submittals for payment, they got paid. And the companies that had to scramble, uh, they were delayed for months. So it, makes, it can make a huge difference. And if you're the guy who's planned for the project going wrong, which many do, unfortunately, uh, you, you stand a much greater chance of getting paid. All right, negotiations. This is really, uh, Scott touched on this uh, earlier in great detail and I just wanted to hit it again because take it or leave it contracts. In the law, we call them contracts of adhesion. You know, uh, when you order a TV or something by Best Buy and, and they have you click and say, you've read it and you agree with all of its terms. Okay, you're not negotiating with Best Buy online. You're not negotiating with Apple. You're not negotiating with Google, okay? Construction contracts, they can be like that, but that is much more the exception than the rule. Even if you're not the world's biggest subcontractor, even if you're, this is a one-off subcontract that you're doing, you say you're a welder or you're a steel fabricator or whatever, a lot of times if you send reasonable red line back and say, I think this works better, in the contracting phase, general contractors are prepared for that. They're ready for it to come back and hit them. They're, they have a team ready to review it and say, look, accept it and get it done or not. 
they usually don't get too hung up on anything that's not super critical. You might absolutely sneak a, sneak a strike through on the, the jury trial line through there. Venue, you might get that. Uh, damages for or attorney's fees provision, stick one in, just one line. A lawyer can do that for you uh, very quickly if you need an attorney's fees provision in a contract. They'll email, I've emailed my clients a language and I said, stick this in section five uh, and you'll get your attorney's fees. So the first step is just to do it. Give it a shot. Uh, have a good rapport with who you're working with, with as subs you usually do. Uh, ask who in the company to send the, the contract to. Shoot it to them. See what they say. Um, if, they were, if they refuse everything, if they just blanket refuse everything, that tells you something about how they operate. It tells you, read every word of that contract. Don't miss a beat. Make sure your submittals, your payment applications are perfect. Uh, because this is going to be a little bit of a paper chase working with this contractor. I can guarantee you that. If they don't care much, they redline it, then they're builders first, contractors second, which is the predominant of what I've seen. And uh, therefore, the contract won't matter until something goes wrong. But in that case, the contract will be written how you want it to be written. Uh, and and it, it's, it can, it's absolutely makes the difference uh, between a completely successful case when it comes to me for litigation and uh, uh, having no case fundamentally. It can be that, that night and day. That's all I got. And I really appreciate this is a lot of information. It was and sorry, probably too much. <laughs> no, it's a lot. And it's good, all good information. So you know, this will be on replay. Everybody that's out there, you can, of course, listen to this, rewind it, play it back. Um, we're going to send the slides out so you can have some barrier, you know, just some ref points of reference from what we talked about in the email too. I'll put some key takeaways that I've had here from some notes that I've been taking along the way. Um, so we can put not only just the point of this is to take this information and not learn it all in an hour. It's to give you the information, get your mind working, get some key takeaways, which I'll put down my key takeaways that I think are important, at least in the email follow up to everyone that's on this. And then you can work from there and make some notes. And of course, um, on the next slide or included, we'll have both um, my contact information and Ben's contact information. You can reach out to us, of course. Here's actually the, here's the slide now. Um, so you have the inf info on both on websites. You can look up both um, folks. And then lastly, just take three or four things that you got from this and incorporate it. This doesn't have to be an all or nothing thing. You can always go back to this and reference it. It doesn't need to make it more stressful. It should be a stress reliever. There's a lot there though, you know, that contracts are tough and there's a lot involved in them. And at least now you're a little better equipped, I hope, uh, from this call of where some watch outs are. Um, but again, key takeaways. Number one, we'll put some clauses together that you need to pay attention to. Um, I would say target your attorney, you know, tell at least in a minimum, just have your attorney take the contract, tell them what your understanding of the agreement is and what you're asked to do in the pr procedure and have them review it and let them just look at those three, four, five clauses that you'll have listed here with whoever your attorney is and let them just give you some basic info. If you do get a big job, especially if it's a little bigger than you might normally do or has more risk associated to it for your business, that might be a good one to have your, your attorney go through in more detail and go through the process together with them. You'll learn a ton just going back and forth with one agreement, enough that you can read these in pretty quick form and, and do a lot of this yourself the second, third, fifth, sixth time. Um, other than that, Ben, anything you wanted to add or a no, key takeaway that I just didn't touch on or we should get back to? No, no, Scott, you really, uh, you really hit on everything that I would close out. I mean, there's, there's, there are, the purpose of this was to put together four or five key things that as subcontractors, if you have going on in your head, when you read through the contract, uh, you'll be in just a 70, 80% better uh, position. That's, and I hope uh, this is helpful to folks. And um, thank you very much for your attention for, for the folks who stuck it through this. I appreciate it. Yeah, key is make sure you don't have any surprises. Um, again, reiterate it, can't reiterate it, can't reiterate it enough. At least if your contract says what you think it's supposed to say, that you're walking into the job knowing yourself, you're gonna be in a much better spot. If you know it's your top where the spots are bad for you, that's good too. But if you have the surprises are what can kill you. 
And that's what you uh, want to try to avoid. Absolutely. You want to make sure that what you're thinking in your head when you get this going and you deploy your crew and you put your capital out there and your equipment and finances that there isn't going to be a surprise that jumps up that you are anticipating one thing and something else happens. That's the most important thing I think to take away from it. Autumn, are there any questions from the audience that we can address? Nope, we have no questions from the audience. Um, so if there's nothing coming in. Um, I will package this up and send this as a webinar replay and our thank you. Um, I'll also add some content to our website, which will be available under our resources page. And you uh, obviously can find that on our website, which is here on the slide. You can get in touch with Ben or Scott through their email um, or through LinkedIn. Um, and thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you, Ben. This was such a treat. Of course. Thank you both. Ben, I really appreciate you taking the time. I know you didn't have to do this and I know you care. So for you folks out there in Texas and you need somebody uh, good, please don't hesitate to reach out to Ben. He really is great. Again, we use him for ourselves for matters and review. So um, I recommend him highly. But everyone, have a great rest of your Wednesday. Enjoy hump day and we'll talk to you all soon. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.